one of the paradoxes in the Buddha's teachings about training the mind is that on the one hand, he talks a lot about solitude, going off alone. When many of the people go into the wilderness. But at the same time, he also talks about the importance of admirable friends. That chat we had just now, talking about associating with wise people, staying away from fools. Because the wise people give you the, the context for your practice. It's possible for people to go out in the wilderness and go crazy, or pick up crazy ideas, or harm themselves. There was a book years back, End of the Wild, about a young man who became disillusioned with society, disillusioned with his family, went off to live in Alaska, and ended up dying. And he left behind some notes that he wrote in the margins of the books and showed that he had some, some good ideas, but also some pretty crazy ideas. And as I was reading the book, I kept thinking, if only he had lived in Thailand. They have a structure for that kind of thing, to go off into the wilderness, but not on your own and not unguided. You have guidance. There's an, actually an apprenticeship. You live near somebody for a while, pick up attitudes of the Dharma. Then you're ready to go into the wilderness. In my own case, my first year as a monk, I spent a lot of time alone on a mountain. Fortunately, I had a John Fuing at the foot of the mountain. So when issues came up and I found that a lot of my childhood and my teenage years and my college years started coming back, issues and resentments, or memories of stupid things I'd done. It was always good to have him to talk to about these things. Sometimes he'd give good advice, and sometimes he'd look at me in a way that indicated this was a really strange problem that someone might have. After all, we were from opposite sides of the earth. And just that look often was better than the advice. Realizing that some of the attitudes I picked up from my childhood were very, very strange, and it would be good to separate myself from them. So I don't think the practice is simply a matter of being alone, or sitting with your eyes closed, or finding some solitude. You have to carry the right attitudes into that solitude. And that's what admirable friendship is for. So when you go into the wilderness, you have a friend with you, a friend with the right attitudes. Which is why the Buddha said that the factors for stream entry start with associating with good people. So it's not just a matter of listening to the Dharma from them, but getting a sense of how they deal with people, how they deal with situations, how they deal with pain, how they deal with disappointment. In a forest monastery, it was also how you deal with work projects, so they can all become part of the training of the mind. And you realize more and more that the practice is really a matter of apprenticeship, hanging around somebody. Because it's not just the verbal knowledge, it's the knowledge of an attitude. It's a quality of the heart, a way of looking at things. And some of those ways of looking at things can be drawn out in words. For me, one of the most helpful ways of looking at a lot of my issues from my childhood was looking at it in terms of a multi-lifetime perspective. So if I was feeling victimized about something, remember that maybe I wasn't just a victim, maybe I'd been the victimizer at some point. Now this process goes back and forth, back and forth, to the point where you just want to say, enough. And rather trying to tally up who was right and who was wrong, you just want to say, enough, I want to get out of here. So there are some things that are contained in the words of the Dharma that are very important. And sometimes they're the most basic things, things teachings on generosity, teachings on virtue, teachings on goodwill, basic merit-making, are really important for what you're doing as you meditate. Things they teach you how 
life you live is shaped by your actions. And an attitude of giving is what gets you started on good things. And how the desire for happiness is something you really want to respect, that attitude of goodwill for everyone, including yourself. Realizing that the search for happiness is not necessarily a selfish thing if you do it in a wise way. You actually develop good qualities in the mind. And so as part of this apprenticeship, you pick up both the attitude of the teacher, the habits of the teacher, the words of the Dharma. And after living all those years with the John Fung, then after he passed away, they appointed a monk from some other place to be the acting abbot. And I was struck immediately. He was a very different kind of person, having lived with someone who, who embodied the Dharma so much. It was striking to find somebody who actually did have a lot of greed and was not ashamed to show it. I realized I could not stay around that person. I didn't want to pick up that person's attitudes. So that's one of the lessons you want to take as you both go into a time of solitude, and is when you come out from that solitude, you've got to be really careful about who your friends are, what are the friends you're taking with you into the solitude. In other words, what attitudes, what ideas you're taking in. And then when you leave, okay, who are you going to hang around with? It's really important. These teachings that are basic, 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 are there because they are so important, not because you're just going to touch on them briefly and then move on. They form the foundation. So look carefully for who you take as your friend. We miss a lot of this nowadays in Dharma circles because the pattern has changed from apprenticeship to mass production. We have a mass-produced dharma. There are techniques that were developed in the 19th century. The Asians were very impressed by European abilities to produce things through mass production. And the idea came that, well, maybe we can strip things down just to very simple principles and very simple practices. We get everything boiled down to something that can be mass-produced on a large level. But the dharma doesn't work that way. And what we miss, of course, is that personal context, the admirable friend, who teaches not only words or a technique, but teaches through actions in general, attitudes in general, so you can pick up something really worthwhile. So when time comes to go into the wilderness, when you're going to be alone, or simply when you're alone in your meditation. The Buddha talks about being secluded from unskillful qualities. That, too, is a kind of seclusion, which means the friends you want to take into the meditation are the, the voices that are going to be doing the direct thought and the evaluation, not only evaluating the relationship of the mind to the breath, but also evaluating the value of being with the breath, the value of maintaining a center as you go through life. and the value of remembering the practices of generosity and virtue, how important they are for meditation. When John Sawat was teaching in Massachusetts one time, at the very end of the retreat, someone asked him about how to carry the practice into daily life, and he responded by talking about the precepts. And some of the people got upset, thinking that he was saying, well, as lay people, they were not ready for carrying meditation into their, into their daily life, so they had to stick with this lowly practice of the precepts. But that wasn't his point. That wasn't what he was trying to say. He saying, if you want to practice meditation, you have to take the precepts with you, because they form the container for your practice. And you want to watch out about the people you hang out with. You want to make sure they're people who follow the precepts as well, because it's so easy to see, well, what they're doing is actually reasonable and actually okay. And it's okay in their behavior, then it becomes okay in your behavior. And you get sucked in bit by bit by bit without realizing it. And then your attitudes about what's 
okay in your meditation start changing as well. You start getting sloppier and keeping after the mind in terms of your mindfulness, in terms of your concentration. So these things are all connected. So remember the value of having the Dharma as your friend as you go into seclusion. Find ways of picking up the right attitudes. Attitude is actually good for your mind, not the attitudes that somebody else might think might be good for the economy or good for this buying their things, making you a good consumer, which is a lot of what our education has been. But attitudes that really do foster good qualities in your heart then spread out from your heart through your actions and your words. It's an all-around practice. It requires an all-around apprenticeship. So when time comes to go alone, you're got, you've got protection all around as well. That, the Buddha said, was one of the duties of a teacher, was to provide protection in all directions. It doesn't mean that the teacher is going around and going to go around looking after you, but the teacher is going to give you the knowledge that you can use to protect yourself wherever you go, which is not, not just a matter of focusing on the breath or being mindful as you do walking meditation. It's a matter of how you talk to yourself and how you talk to yourself into doing things, out of doing things, when you're on your own. 